Hi, I'm Marcus Weaver Hightower, a professor at the University of North Dakota. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about genre, modality, register, and participatory framework, which are all sort of structural aspects of discourse uh, that are important to think about in doing discourse analysis. Now we want to step back a little bit and think about the difference between discourse and language. Strauss and Fies, uh, who are kind of the structurers of the um, topics I'll be talking about today, uh, say that there are uh, a number of different ways in which language is not necessarily discourse. Discourse is different from language. Uh, it includes language, of course, but there's more to it. Uh, for instance, language is, of course, linked to context. Something has to be going on. It can't just be sort of pieces of language that are disconnected from uh, you know the the things that people are actually doing in an actual place in the world discourse also requires participants language can be just sort of as I said before kind of cut off pieces of uh, words and grammar and those kinds of things but participants are required for discourse discourse is also built on responsivity so in other words uh, those participants are responding to each other in certain ways or there's some kind of hoped for action or change that uh, someone who is initiating discourse is hoping for and that response to the discourse uh, is also important and then fourth and finally discourse is bounded by structure of course language itself has structure but when we have a context and participants trying to respond to one another, those parts of the discourse are actually structured in particular ways. And so the things I'll talk about today in this particular video are about the structure of discourse. So let's take a for instance, uh, and I'll use this example throughout uh, this particular video. Uh, I went on a ghost tour in Port Arthur, Tasmania, which is uh, that small island at the bottom of Australia. And basically what it is, it's like most other tours, but it happens at night and they tell stories about ghosts and, uh, you know, uh, all the horrible things that happened there in Port Arthur, which was a uh, sort of a, a prison colony, if you will, uh, back in the uh, colonial days of Australia. And much like discourse that we were just talking about, this particular tour uh, is an actual event of discourse. It is linked to a context, and that context, as you can see here, is kind of where you are. There's these old buildings. It's nighttime. Uh, it's kind of cold. You can see people are sort of uh, wearing jackets and those kinds of things. And that context. Uh, not only where you are and when you are, but uh, the kind of relationships that you have there play a big part in what the discourse is all about. Now, discourse, as I said, also requires participants, and of course, the participants here uh, are highlighted. You've got, of course, the tour guide, and you've got the tourists who are listening to the tour guide. Those are the participants. There's a kind of exchange going on between the tour guide and the uh, other tourists that are uh, that are there and they are responding to one another in very particular ways and of course it's bounded by a structure so the the actual language that's being used and all the other semiotic resources that this tour guide is going to use are in some ways bounded by the relationships who's there where they are what the expectations are of the people who've come those kinds of things Now, in thinking through this ghost tour, we want to think first about its genre, and that's one of the main topics for today. In any piece of discourse, you're usually dealing with some kind of genre. And a genre is a kind of structure for discourse. It provides the consistency and recognizability for discourse. And there's lots and lots and lots of different types of genres that we can talk about as a sort of discourse genre. Things like a sermon, things like a lecture, things like a, uh, you know, ordering at a drive-through. That's a certain genre in itself. 
and there's a kind of consistency and recognizability to those pieces of discourse that kind of structures what's going on. And it's based on social convention, that third uh, bullet point there. There's certain conventions that we have in the social world, and those conventions can be broken, of course. I mean, there's no uh, necessary, uh, like, penalty if you go to a drive through and, you know, don't order in the way that people are expecting. Uh, but there is at least an expectation of what you're going to do and how you're going to act. And, of course, the genre shapes the discourse's content and purpose. So any kind of genre-based discourse is going to have particular content that people are thinking of. You wouldn't go to the drive through and in the midst of ordering your uh, hamburger, you know, start telling a story about, you know, your sick aunt, right? I mean, there's there's certain content that's expected in within that genre. And of course, there's a purpose. The purpose being that, you know, one person is going to get your order, another person is going to uh, actually make the order and hopefully get some food out of it. So uh, when we talk about genre, it's really important to think about content and purpose. So when we look back at this notion of a ghost tour, there are a number of different genres that get put into what we would think of as a ghost tour. So in some ways it's kind of a subgenre. Uh, but we could also talk about it as a genre in and of itself. So, I mean, if we can think of a ghost tour as a genre, then literally we could have, you know, millions of different types of genres for, you know, various different kinds of activities that we do with language. Now, in a ghost tour, one of the genres that this conforms to is the notion of a tour. There's a guide, and it's not just any guide. It's somebody who's actually educated about the stories that are going to be told. Uh, part of what's going on in a tour is that there are other tourists there. You know, you don't, I mean, sometimes you might have a tour that's just you, uh, but for the most part, you'll usually be going with lots of other tourists. Uh, the tour will actually be pre planned, they'll have specific stops along the way, they'll have pre planned stories that they've maybe told a thousand different times. Oftentimes, they sound really rehearsed and of course part of the purpose of doing a tour is to get information I mean you know you might want to be having fun some of those other kinds of purposes but typically the discourse is oriented towards being informative and of course there's a lot of walking on a tour uh, usually you don't have a tour uh, in a historical site that has a whole lot of uh, you know, like driving around in a car. Now there are car tours, of course, uh, but in a historical site, uh, you know, usually you'll be walking from place to place, or it might be a mixture of those kinds of things. So there's travel involved, generally speaking, in a tour. And another genre is history. And typically with a ghost tour, since you're dealing with ghosts who are, you know, uh, people who are deceased and their spirits supposedly remain behind you know normally there's going to be uh, it's going to be talking about things that happened in history so they'll be presented in a kind of history there so there'll be chronology to it you know this happened and this happened and that happened uh, notions of preservation sometimes so wanting to kind of concretize the history and and keep it going forward into the future Typically in a history, it's a fact-based kind of presentation. There's not wild speculation and those kinds of things. And it'll include names, dates, events, all those kinds of things. In addition, there's ghost stories that are a part of the ghost tour, right? I mean, it is a tour, but it's called a ghost tour because ghost stories will be told. So oftentimes these ghost tours will happen at night. Uh, you know, these are best told in sort of dark, unfamiliar places. Anytime you've been told ghost stories, it's probably, you know, camping out or things like that. Uh, so that there's just sort of a context that's built into something that's supposed to be kind of a scary way. Oftentimes it's done at night so that, you know, that's supposedly in a lot of places the time of day when spirits come out. There's also in ghost stories, of course, supernatural elements, things like spirits and souls and, uh, you know, being able to move objects without an actual person being there to do it. Oftentimes, ghost stories will feature violent or brutal deaths, and that's kind of what causes the unrest of the spirit, 
those kinds of things. Ghost stories oftentimes, however, kind of play with a line between belief and non-belief. Uh, so they'll try to present evidence that suggests that kind of unexplained things could be supernatural. Uh, they challenge people who don't believe. So uh, those who come with a sort of inherent amount of skepticism about ghosts or the non-believers, right, they get challenged throughout a ghost story. And of course, also with ghost stories, the whole purpose really is to frighten people. It might be to try to get people to believe, but you know, there's supposed to be a certain amount of tension and scariness involved with ghost stories. And of course, in a ghost tour, there's also an element of kind of a commercial transaction. There's a kind of politeness between the tourists and the tour guide. This is maybe enhanced because the tour guide again is is an educated person about the particular area. They're sort of they take the expert role, and the non-expert is of course supposed to be polite to the expert. There's kind of a personal distance in it, right? Uh, that comes along not only with being that kind of expert non-expert role but also because there's a kind of transaction going on you're buying these stories and the scary experience from this person uh, and of course a kind of unspoken element of what's going on in a commercial uh, transaction is these kind of perceptions of worth you know are, are they going to be giving you an experience that is worth the money that you've paid for this particular tour and so the tour guides are playing on this perception of worth and trying to give you your money's worth and the tourists are often trying to get that out of it as well also uh, something that's interesting about the commercial transaction part of it is oftentimes there'll be warnings involved right a kind of uh, you know covering your butt with with the insurance company kind of stuff so you know are the uh, people on the tour healthy enough, you know, so they tell you to wear comfortable clothes. And if you've got a heart condition, maybe you don't want to go. Uh, warnings about taking children along. So, you know, is the is the child going to be scared and have nightmares? And, you know, please, parents, don't bring them if they're super scared, that kind of stuff. So that kind of uh, warnings to, to help protect against indemnification is part of what goes on with a ghost tour discourse. So you can see because there's all of these kinds of genres going on, they're kind of mixed together. The ghost tour is, is a sort of hybrid or mixed genre of all of these different things. And you can see in this genre a lot of different tensions between these various genres. So, you know, a history genre and a ghost story genre. I mean, there's a sort of facticity that's in tension between those two things uh, and makes for a lot of interesting kind of uh, analysis of what you might do with this genre. So we might ask why is genre important? Why thinking about you know how these pieces of discourse are structured, why is that important? Well genre can make you sensitive as an analyst to things like social conventions, constraints that people have, right? Because genres is, is really it's about expectations in terms of content in terms of purpose, in terms of the way we use language to do certain things. Uh, it can also make you sensitive to certain transgressions, right? I mean, one of the things that happens with genres, if, if you break the genre, people notice. Uh, or, and you know, it could be they notice and it's funny. It could be they notice and they get angry, that kind of stuff. But whatever it happens to be, if there is a transgression, people will notice it. And of course, you can see power relations in particular genres, right? There are certain relationships that, you know, only one person or a type of person or a person with particular credentials can exercise a particular genre of discourse. So if you think about like a wedding ceremony, for instance, only people who are authorized to marry people, and that means authorized by a state or by a religion, that kind of thing, can actually marry people. So they have control over this particular genre. Something like a ghost tour, you think about the expert uh, tour guide as having a kind of power that the tourists don't particularly have. And uh, while it might not be quite as serious as sort of state-sponsored power relations, there's still a kind of social power relation there that we want to pay attention to, and that's what genre analysis can do for us.
Now the next thing we talked about genre now we want to move on to modality so modality is really it's kind of the medium through which a discourse is actually delivered and it can be oral it can be written or it can be e-discourse that's kind of really broad categories and of course there's a lot of overlap within and between those especially when we think about e-discourse because oftentimes it's written but then you can add things like audio and video to it to make it a much more sort of uh, multimodal presentation. So when we talk about a ghost tour for instance most of what happens in a ghost tour is oral discourse. There's an actual live person out on the street or in the historical location telling you the story orally and other people are the tourists are sitting there and listening to that presentation but there's also e-discourse that can go along with these ghost tours uh, or even written discourse so you could have something like a pamphlet you know if you go to a tourist town where lots and lots of tourists go you know you'll go to a hotel and they'll have pamphlets there or you'll look up on the internet you know where can I find a ghost tour uh, in this particular uh, historical location that I'm visiting uh, and as you can see down here in this website uh, you know there's there's links uh, there's sound on the page all those kinds of things that can sort of try to market the uh, ghost tour to you but also in some ways shape your expectations about the ghost tour uh, you can see over to the right of that web page there's kind of an image that one of the tourists brought and it's supposed to look sort of like a ghost uh, those kinds of things and you can see actually there's a link uh, up at the top that says actual sightings and things like that and so there's this kind of uh, there's an experience actually that happens before the actual ghost tour that's supposed to ramp up your expectations get you excited make you wonder if you're gonna run across a ghost those kinds of things uh, and in cases like this it's actually hard to say where the discourse begins and ends you know does it begin when you've looked at the web page and end after the tour uh, you know is there conversation after the tour between you and uh, people that may have gone with you those kinds of things so the genre uh, of any particular discourse event it can take on lots of different forms uh, or what we might call a kind of multimodal discourse so uh, you know the ghost tour experience if we consider all of the various things that are communicating about the ghost tour might actually be a multimodal discourse it could be you know the writing in a pamphlet and then the oral discourse you get that when you're there or it might be that the internet site and the oral discourse uh, come together to be a multimodal presentation so if we step back and ask the same question that we did about genre, why is modality important? Well, modality can make you sensitive to some of the same kinds of things like social conventions. We don't act the same and use the same language in oral discourse as we do in e-discourse. There's some overlap, but it's not the same. So you wouldn't you know, say the same thing in a blog post or a tweet as you would uh, when you're out on the street speaking about you know a, a historical mansion that's haunted uh, you can also see transgressions there you know if you did use sort of tweet language in oral discourse people would really kind of they would be troubled by it they would you know it would be seen as a transgression and of course power relations can also be seen through these particular uh, modalities too in a blog post or a website there's a kind of one-way communication whereas in oral discourse you, you can sort of speak back to it uh, but of course you can't always speak back in ways that are as powerful as the person who's speaking to you so you know that power relationship between the tour guide and the tourist uh, remains when, within that oral discourse Is this house right across the street from us here? This is the Mercer House of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, Infamy, 
Now this house over here was built in 1860 for General Hugh Mercer. Now General Mercer went on to become a Confederate general during the Civil War. He was present at the First Battle of Manassas. It's also called the Bull Run by some. Manassas was a great victory for the Confederacy though. Certainly it was not without its hang-ups. There were a number of deserters at Manassas. General Mercer brought six Confederate deserters into his tent after the battle and shot them all. See, all throughout the war, General Mercer was sending oodles of money down here to finance the building of this house. And this was going to be his big show house after the war. That never happened. See, after the war, like so many of his friends, General Mercer was bankrupted. He didn't have a penny to his name. So despite the fact that this house bears his name, General Mercer never even set foot inside this house. He couldn't afford to live here. And here, it seems like the house itself has turned nasty. There's something wrong with this house. It has a rap sheet for sure. Almost every single owner of this house has been a murderer. Now, after General Mercer, in 1902, turn of the century, Dr. and Mrs. Wilder lived in this house. One morning in 1902, 72-year-old Dr. Wilder just decided he'd had enough of poor Mrs. Wilder. So he went into his mm -hmm. wife's bedroom. This top left-hand window right here held a pillow over his wife's face as she lay there, peacefully asleep in her bed, smothered her and killed her, walked into his own bedroom next door, poured himself a drink, walked out onto the balcony and took a nice fresh breath of the morning air. I guess it was unfazed that he just snuffed out his own dear wife for 50 years. But later that same afternoon, Dr. Wilder was found on the sidewalk beneath that balcony, dead from a fall. And we do not know to this day, 110 years later, it remains a mystery, did Dr. Wilder jump, slip, or maybe it didn't take too long for Mrs. Wilder to come back and get hers, eh? So that was an example of an actual piece of a ghost tour in uh, Savannah, Georgia. I've actually been on this ghost tour. I didn't see that particular thing. That, that wasn't my video. That was a video I got off of YouTube. Uh, but in that video, you'll see kind of what goes on in these ghost tours, the kinds of ways that they uh, actually go about doing the tour. I want to look at a notion of register. Uh, we've talked about the genre and the modality of these ghost tours. But what about the register? And you'll remember, hopefully, from the reading that uh, register is the grammatical, sort of the grammar, lexical, that's word choice, and prosodic, and that's kind of like the quality of voice, uh, the, the features of those uh, that a discourse uh, has. And those signal membership in categories of gender, race, class, those kinds of things. It signals identity, and it signals ideology. So the grammar you use, the word choices you make, and the way you say things all can signal a lot about you as a person. This is kind of the, the main understanding that we get from sociolinguistics, right? Is that the linguistics of how we talk, how we write, those kinds of things signal something about our social standing. So how does the uh, individual person who's doing discourse actually do things with register? What are the differences? The first thing is colloquialisms. These are more informal, more uh, kind of culturally bound ways of talking. Then there's more formalism. So when one is trying to sort of mine their P's and Q's and really conform to uh, more kind of formalized conventions. And technical lexicon. So in somebody's particular uh, register, excuse me, they could uh, use words that are very sort of specific to uh, a particular profession, let's say, uh, you know, like they're a scientist and they use kind of scientific lexicons, or they're a lawyer and they use kind of legal words, that kind of thing. But also, and one thing that uh, Strauss and Fees don't really get to that much is uh, the fact that register can include prosody. So, what sorts of uh, pitch and volume and the kind of 
lilt of one's speech go along with particular identities, so those prosody things, and also gestures and movements. So to what extent can somebody sort of move freely? How can, can somebody sit? Uh, can somebody lounge? You know, all the kinds of things that say something about who you are, your identity, ideologies, those kinds of things through those non-linguistic uh, uh, parts of the semiotic structure of discourse. So in the video, you might remember, uh, here's, here's something that uh, the tour guide said. And I want to point out a few things that are to do with the register. So he says, now in this house over here, uh, excuse me, now this house over here was built in 1860 for General Hugh Mercer. Now General Mercer went on to become a Confederate general in the Civil War. He was present at the First Battle of Manassas. It's also called Bull Run by some. Manassas was a great victory for the Confederacy, though. Certainly it was not without its hang-ups. So look at something like the First Battle of Manassas. This in some ways shows a kind of technical lexicon register because the first battle of Manassas suggests that there is a second battle of Manassas and he's also using in contrast to this notion of being called bull run by some so he's kind of placing himself within a historical discourse now this uh, this phrase called bull run by some it's a passive construction right the sum is a very vague word that probably means something like historians or some people with a particular ideology would call this bull run now he doesn't call it bull run he calls it manassas and he continually calls it manassas and he's suggesting that there is some reason that he's calling it manassas rather than bull run so there's something about the register here that we want to pay attention to and of course, down at the bottom, he talks about, you know, it's not without its hangups. This is a very colloquial expression, this notion of hangups in a war. Uh, and what he's talking about, of course, is uh, having deserters from the battle as a hangup. Now, this is a very kind of strange word to use, right? But it, it evokes a particular register, and it's a much more informal register than, say, a historian might use. Now, he's got elements of the historian's language up there with Manassas versus Bull Run, but then he kind of softens it with a more colloquial, friendly, informal kind of thing that, that might be more responsive to tourists. Later in the transcript, you can see, he says, see, all through the, throughout the war, General Mercer was sending oodles of money down here to finance the building of this house. This was going to be his big show house after the war. That never happened. Again, we see some colloquially expressions, oodles of money, right? I mean, oodles is a, a rather strange informal word that you wouldn't use necessarily, especially, you know, if you were talking about how someone finances a house, you wouldn't normally, in a, in a very kind of proper speech, uh, a historical speech, talk about oodles of money. Uh, and this notion of show house, this notion that, uh, you know, he was, uh, you might say, like a mansion or something like that, but show house is this very colloquial expression. Uh, and then the final sentence, uh, I actually like the kind of rhetorical uh, idea that's going on here in terms of register uh, and using a very short sentence that's supposed to punctuate the point. That never happened. And of course, this is uh, a kind of looking back on history uh, to sort of provide a contrast uh, and it's with the sort of you know the the knowledge of what actually happened looking back at uh, what the expectation was so uh, there's a, a number of different register issues here that we can kind of see that there's a tension between the historical register and a more sort of informal colloquial register. And I also want to point out that uh, there's a rhetorical device being used throughout. There's see and now uh, 
used as kind of a rhetorical device that's very specific to oral modality. Remember we talked about more modality being the sort of mode of the discourse, whether oral, written, or e-discourse. Uh, he keeps along and along using the word see and the word now at the beginning of sentences to show kinds of shifts in the purpose of what he's saying. When he says see, what he's meaning to do is kind of give not only a shift in topic, but also a certain amount of context, a certain amount of analysis in what he's saying when he says see. And then when he shifts with now, he has a slightly different kind of purpose. But uh, this is a good example here, in addition to the register, of showing how modality is being used because we wouldn't necessarily start a sentence with C or now usually in writing. It's really very much a part of or, or, excuse me, oral modality. But back to register, we might ask that same question that we had talked about before with genre and modality is why is register important? Well, register can make you sensitive to things like social conventions again, right? Like who the people are uh, and how they show who they are with their language. Register can make you sensitive to identity work. You know, what features of the language is somebody using to talk about who they are and what they believe? And of course, because we're talking about identity, power relations come into it. Finally then, I want to talk about participant frameworks. And in uh, this is Goffman's understanding of, you know, the intended and unintended participants in a discursive event and their changing roles. And of course, there's you know three basic roles that we can talk about. There's the speakers, there's the hearers, and then there's the overhearers. So people who are you know intended to be part of the discourse, and then people who are not necessarily being intended to be part of the discourse. And of course, these roles can shift throughout the course of an interaction. Right? Speakers can become hearers. Hearers can become speakers. Overhearers can then become speakers who then become hearers and then speakers and you know so you can kind of shift around within an interaction uh, so a participant framework guides really how those roles are divvied out and what those roles are supposed to actually do what are the expectations for somebody who is speaking what is the expectation for somebody who's hearing so if we think about that ghost tour again, right? The tour guide, generally speaking, does most of the talking, right? They tell their scary stories and then the participants listen or they're also supposed to sometimes react so they can become speakers. They can gasp and show appreciation for how scary things are or they can ask questions, they can engage the person with sort of historical questions, things like that. Generally speaking, because there's this expert relationship, they wouldn't necessarily make a lot of statements, right? You might have a history professor who's along who might want to kind of engage in sort of, you know, lectures uh, with the uh, with the tour guide. But generally speaking, the, the, the tourists are supposed to ask questions, right? Uh, not, not to sort of give their own notion. But this reacting, asking questions. And, you know, in terms of participant framework, maybe there are people who are overhearing. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're on a tour, if you didn't want to pay the money, you'll kind of, you know, sort of wander around the edge and try to overhear what the tour guide is saying. Uh, but, you know, it could also be other people who are overhearing, uh, people who are maybe eavesdropping maybe even ghosts, right? I mean, if there are ghosts on this tour, maybe the ghosts are listening in. That's not necessarily who the uh, tour guide is, you know, addressing the discourse to. Obviously, that's their story. They know what it is, right? But uh, maybe, the, uh, maybe the ghosts are actually out there eavesdropping. 
So that's kind of some structural issues that we have with discourse. This notion of genre, the notion of modality, register, participant frameworks. So I'd like you to take those and do a small activity. This is not something that for those of you who are uh, in my class, it's not something you have to necessarily turn in, but it would like you to sort of jot down some notes about it. So here's what the activity is. In a second, I'm going to show you a cartoon, and I'd like you to read the cartoon on that following slide. You can pause the video, uh, or you can actually look it up at wondermark.com. I've included the date and those kinds of things. And I'd like you to treat it as if it's kind of a transcript of a real conversation. Okay, so yes, it, the actual thing you'll be looking at is a cartoon, but I don't want you to treat it as a comic strip. I want to, I want you to treat it as a conversation, and that's where I want you to answer the questions from. And the first question is, what might we say the genre of that conversation is? So think up a name that you can use to kind of describe what that conversation actually is. Then what's the modality? You know, how is that... Uh, conversation being transmitted in what form. Then kind of go through and pick out some of the features of register. You know, what are the word choices? What are the grammatical choices that someone is that, that the participants are using to show who they are and what they believe? And then finally think about what's the participant framework? You know, who are the participants? And what are the expectations of the participants in this particular conversation? You know, there's specific things that one party is supposed to do and specific things that the other party is supposed to do. And if they don't do those things, then it's kind of a transgression. So I'd like you to think through that just a little bit. So jot down some notes about it uh, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll give you some insight into how these types of genres in discourse are structured. So thanks for watching and hope to see you again soon.